So when we left off, we had just run our behavior space model, right? And we had gotten some results from it. And just to remind everyone again, right? We had looked at, um, this is the blank behavior space experiment. This is the one that we actually ran where we varied uh, the number of, of people in the model, right? And as a result of running that, we got some output that looks like this. And I'll actually pull this up in Excel and give you a few uh, more details about it. So now that you've run your model in behavior space and you've gotten your CSV file dumped out wherever it has, if you have Excel on your machine, you should just be able to double click on that CSV file and it'll open up and it looks like this. And I kind of want to use this real quickly to just show you what the data looks like, right? So uh, let me just zoom in a little bit for you, right? So you'll see that you get a little bit of a header information. You get the name of the file, uh, the name of the experiment, when it was run, and then this describes the world, how big the world was. Um, so, you know, by the way, our experiment is varying population, right, from 50 to 200 by 50 increments. It's not actually varying population density. But if we hold the world uh, size constant, it is varying population density because if we increase the population while keeping the space the same, the population density is going up. Um, you'll then see um, the, this run number, and this run number is just a, the, a unique number that corresponds to that run of the model for that results. Now, um, you'll notice that it's out of order. Um, that's because since NetLogo is multi-cored, in other words, it'll take advantage of multi-cores on your machine, uh, whichever run finishes first, on whichever core it's on, it's gonna write out to this file first. So in this case, it was core four, that finished first. Core one actually is gonna be one of the last ones to finish, and that's because core one was the, is the one that's always running in the graphical interface. Uh, and because of that, it actually takes longer than any of the other ones. Uh, now you could of course just sort this data, right, by the run number if you wanted to in, um, in, in NetLogo or in Excel, right? And then you'll get them in order, right, in terms of the way they were spun up, the original order is in terms. But you'll notice we now have all the variables that we entered, all the parameters, sorry, that we entered uh, to create the model, right? Um, and then we also have the ticks, which is our output variable. Uh, by the way, we actually didn't need to output ticks because NetLogo defaults to outputting the step at which the model terminated. But I did it just to make sure we had it in there, right? To make it more explicit, right, as to what was going on. And then you'll notice the number of people is going up from 50 to 100, 150 to 200. So this is, uh, this is a quick way to look at the data. That's why I brought it in here. Now we're gonna uh, move over to uh, R to actually show you how you might wanna summarize the data. So before we dive right into the R code to summarize the data, let's talk a little bit about why we might wanna summarize the data. So if you remember when we were looking at the raw data, right, we're looking at 10 runs for four different output variables that's really hard to do, and especially as, as, as your data sets get larger and larger, as your output input variables get larger and larger, it's very easy to do. Summary statistics are one way for us to characterize a large data set in order to understand what's going on. Now, they don't always work, right? If you remember back to the full distribution video I did, right, sometimes the means can be the same for very different distributions. So it's helpful to visualize the overall patterns of data. And I'll talk a little bit about how to do that as well in R and when we talk about graphs. But one of the things you might want to do right off the bat is just calculate the mean and standard deviation of your output results. So in our case, we were talking about what the percentage of, uh, what the time, number of ticks it took to reach 100 percentage was for a 50, 100, 100, 50, 200. And here I've actually calculated out the mean, which is the average time, right? And the standard deviation, which is a measure of how varied uh, the numbers, the other numbers are away from that mean, right? So the mean is calculated by just taking all of the numbers of ticks and dividing by the total number. Whereas the standard deviation is calculated by taking uh, the difference between each of the values, squaring it, adding all those up, dividing by the number of runs we have, and then taking the square root of that. So it indicates how spread out the, um, the individual run results are from this mean, right? Uh, so this, it, you know, you don't have to memorize any of these formulas because luckily they're all built into R and you can just use R to do that. And I'll stop now to show you that. Okay, so now you can see that I'm in the R console window and I've pulled up this uh, population-density.r script which I wrote to analyze this data. 
And you can use a very similar script to analyze data outputs from your model as well. And I'll kind of teach you a little bit about how to do that. Um, there's a couple of little things that go on here, and we'll go through this line by line. But you know, this is not an R class. Um, I am going to use it, and so hopefully you'll pick it up a little, and I'll try and teach you about it as I go through. Uh, but if you want to look into that, um, there are other great tutorials on R, right? So the first thing I do is I pull in this library HMISC, um, and HMISC is a library that provides this command called error bar that I like. Um, if for some reason HMISC isn't installed on your machine, uh, there is, you can use the package installer, and this is true for any of the libraries I looked at. Now, for some reason, the CRAN, um, which is where the, the, all the R uh, packages um, are, are sit, um, is down right now, so I'm not going to hit it, but you, what you normally want to do is hit git list, then type in the package name, and then hit install dependencies, select the HMS package, and hit install selected, and you'll be able to get all of the, the packages that you need. Right um, for that particular package. Now you gotta make sure you install dependencies because HMISC will rely upon other packages that are out there as well. Um, and so you wanna make sure you get all the ones that you need to make that package run. Okay. So once I've done all that, I should then be able to do HMISC and you can see it says it's loading grid, lattice, survival. I don't actually need all of this uh, but to support error bars, but you know, it doesn't hurt to bring it all in. The next thing you'll notice is there's a command called data equals read.csv. This is a built-in R command that allows us to read a CSV file. It then specifies the file. It then says skip equals six. This is gonna skip the header information. Um, and then when I bring all that in, right, I now have the data loaded. And I could look at it real quickly. I could do head data, which lets me look at the data. Um, the first couple lines of the data, and you can see the data is all there. Uh, the run, the variant, the connections, um, the ticks, just like we were looking at in Excel. Now the next line is actually going to, so this, by the way, this is one of the lines that kind of uh, messes with people at times. I'm going to give you the code exactly as you see it here, but you need to change this path, this path, to wherever your file is, wherever your output file is. Right, and then if you if you called your model something different, or if you called the experiment something different, rather than the default built into Net logo, you also need to change that as well in here, right? Um, so um, that's one thing that can kind of mess people up when they're loading their data. The other thing that can kind of mess you up is that if your column names are in a different order than my column names. Now this should happen in this model because we're running the exact same models, but. In other cases where you're kind of doing changes to the model at the same time as I am, it might happen because of the fact that if you have your parameters listed differently, the columns won't be in the same order. So one thing you should check is when you do the head data, check to see if it matches up to the way that I do the column names. And in this case, let's see, so it's run, run, variant, variant, degree, connections per node, same thing, num people, num people, in it, number infected, number infected, disease decay, disease decay, step into it, last tick. Right, so that's all there. That all works out fine for us. So the next line, so I'm gonna run that command. Actually, I actually haven't run that one yet. So, and in, in R, right, on the PCs, uh, sorry, on the Macs, you do a command enter to run any command uh, that you have in your little R notebook. So then the next command is gonna aggregate that data by the initial number of people uh, using the function mean. And what that means is that it's going to find all the cases where the initial number of people is the same, and then average the data rows that results in that, right? And so if I run that, it's gonna give me some errors because like variance isn't a numerical value, so it can't actually average that, right? But then if I look at the results of that run, right, I now have 50, 100, 150, 200. And so that one command gives us those mean values that we wanted from before, right? Uh, and then I can also do the same for the standard deviation. The only difference here is I told it the function that it's using is SD rather than mean, right? Uh, other than that, the commands are exactly the same. Um, and, oh, and by the way, I also told it to do, to call the thing that's aggregating over the init number of people. This just means that, because that's the first column it's gonna put in uh, the aggregation results, it allows us to put it out there. Now, a lot of times what I do once I've done that is I actually do what's called a column bind or a C bind, column bind, not column bind the flower. Um, and if I do that, right, um, I am going to combine the initnum people column with the mean values with the standard deviation column. So I'm going to pull out those three columns 
from these two data sources, right? So here's the ag SD, here's the ag mean, right? What I want is I want this column, I want this column, which is, the, sorry, this column, which is the standard deviation, and this column, which is the mean, all together. And so if I run that, see, I get the output, and that's the table that's exactly the same table, uh, I mean, with different data as the table we were just looking at, right? So this gives me the ability to do summary statistics for any of my models. And you know, this is a common template that you're probably gonna use in a lot of your models, right? You're gonna load the data in, you're gonna rename the columns just because the original column names that are gives to NetLogo files are kind of unintuitive. Uh, and then you're going to aggregate the data, usually by taking the means and the standard deviations, and then you're gonna look at the results. And here we can clearly see now, to, this is the first answer to that initial investigation, that for the means, as the population goes up, the mean uh, time to 100% ticks goes down. Uh, now, interestingly enough, it looks like the error bars of 200 and 150 are overlapping, right? Because if you add 115 to 130, you get 145. If you track 148, if you subtract 21 from 148, you get 127, which is within that, right? And so as a result of that, there may not actually be a statistically significant difference between 150 and 200. That's something to investigate, right? Um, and, we'll, and we'll kind of at least look at a graphical approach to looking at that in the next lecture.